So I know this is really the last session, but it has been a great day, you know, for at least for me to kind of listen to all the all the different experiences and the insights that were shared. Um, really, I think this is a big topic. Uh, you know, analytics for the talent agenda is a big topic. And what I wanted to do was, you know, build on the on the themes, but a li little bit taking a step in terms of where we see this going, you know, especially for the workforce and the workplace. You know, what are the different scenarios that we are going to see? And uh, more talk with the respect of artificial intelligence, you know, and, and which builds on, on all of the predictive analytics topic that we are talking about. I think, you know, artificial intelligence, all of us are hearing a lot of that today. There's a lot of buzz right now on, on artificial intelligence and what it can do. But I think the interesting thing that I find on artificial intelligence is that you know, it's all about us, you know, it's all about people. It's keeping people as the, as the topmost agenda, uh, be it with respect to, you know, how we interact and we engage with the world. I uh, moved from Bangalore to Germany about three years back and, uh, uh, you know, Google Translate is my AI engine, you know, it's always useful because I get bills almost every alternate day. Uh, there's a lot of paper in Germany, you know, and it's all in German, right? And they expect that you should understand it. I used to go to my neighbor and, us to comprehend, you know, what's there because there is always a nice Euro tag against each of the paper. You don't know whether it's an offer or whether they're asking for money, right? <laughs> and if you're delayed, you get second one with a higher number. <laughs> so, so, you know, we used to do that. But, you know, three years back, we used to do that. But now I don't do it because I, the AI translate, you know, Google Translate is pretty powerful, actually. You know, it can really give you a pretty, fairly accurate uh, representation of what the, what the statement is. And that, for me, is AI in action. You know, without that... Uh, uh, I have to depend on a lot of people, which I don't have to. Yeah? And some of these are very personal information. I don't like to show the letter, right? So that is the AI for me in person, you know. And uh, and I think that's the opportunity that we have in terms of how you know artificial intelligence is an opportunity to help each each of us as talent, as professionals, as employees in terms of how we work. You know, what is the nature of work that we do? You know, as well as. Uh, how we create a different experience altogether, you know, the experience that I just talked about, how do you translate that into a workplace, you know, I think that's, that's the opportunity um, and that's why I find it so intriguing. So when it comes to talent, right, you know, what is, uh, I mean, how do I relate that to tra talent, right, you know, when, when we talk about AI, because there's a lot of talk about that in the business context, but how does it, you know, really make sense from a people perspective, right? And it starts with, you know, our ability to actually sense all the signals, you know, that is coming in, right? You know, all the signals that is coming in from my business, all the signals that is coming in from my workforce, from my people, right? And they go hand in hand, right? And based on that, you know, ability to sense all the signals, you know, I think we just heard uh, talking about, you know, the video signals, the audio signals, you know, all the unstructured data plus the, you know, structured data, right? All of those are sources of signals. Uh, taking those signals, how do we start putting context, right, into those signals? And how do we start comprehending, you know, as to what is it telling to me about the needs and preferences and the wants of my talent pool, you know, the experiences that they are looking for? How does that triangulate with respect to what the business is, you know, going and what are the business expectations and business demand? And then the ability to actually use, you know, machine learning, art, you know, all the deep learning capabilities to start putting it into action. So that the organizations can start taking proactive actions yeah, in the way you actually plan your talent strategy that is in harmony with your business strategy, right? How do you start creating those new experiences you know, into action for your employees, right? That obviously helps in creating the next level of superior experience for your customers. And that's where the action becomes important. And then more importantly, I think with AI, you know, with all the data that is coming in and that you're training your models, right? you are able to actually constantly improve. And that is going to be very important, especially when we are talking about an agile workforce, a liquid workforce. Because, you know, the world is changing and hence, you know, the algorithms that we, did, we built, they will need to adapt very, very rapidly uh, so that we can actually meet up with the changing demand. And, and if you look at all of these dimensions, this is what, you know, AI is, but in the context of, you know, a talent and a, and a people organization. We did a you know, research, we came out with this research around the impact of artificial intelligence on all the top economies. Um, and this is available on Accenture Newsroom, you can go and download it. it we basically looked at uh, 12 major economies that constitute 50% of the economic output globally, right? And we, we kind of looked at what is the impact it will have you know, on the economic output in the next, uh, you know, by 2035. And one of the big, um, you know, insights we got, we, 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 we interviewed about 3,000 plus corporates, you know, globally around this. And we, we found that it has a huge impact in doubling up these economies. You know, Germany, we are looking at probably almost doubling it up, you know, almost a $1 trillion, you know, uh, business output. Obviously, it's hinging a lot around 
you know, driving efficiencies. And, and our research showed that, you know, it could be about 40 to 50 percent improvement in efficiencies that will happen, which means translating back into, into the people agenda, it is going to actually redefine, you know, what kind of work people do, right? How those work is actually going to be delivered, you know? Uh, how much of that work will be delivered by software, by bots, by machines, and by humans? Um, how do you actually look at the more, I think there was a concept of design that creates a greater experience, you know, for human beings in, in driving that so that the productivity and the, and the satisfaction at the same time is maximized. And this is something, you know, obviously it's a research study, you know, we will have to look at 2035 where we finally land, land. but this is the potential, you know, that we are talking about and it's going to have a profound impact on how work is done, what's the nature of workforce we will have, what kind of practices we will have in the workplace that will help us achieve that. And why is that so important? Because what artificial intelligence is doing is bringing together capabilities, yeah? bringing together a constellation of capabilities that helps to mimic you know, human capabilities as well as augment human capabilities. You know, all of us you know, can understand me because you know, I am speaking English, everybody can interpret that, right? The ability to hear speech, you know, ability to contextualize the video images that we all see, right, with our eyes, having a machine kind of understand that, you know, a machine that senses it, right, creates a huge impact because, you know, there are certain situations that we have, let's say, in a manufacturing setup where it's very risky, very hazardous, right, and maybe those kind of activities, if we have the machine which can see, which can understand, you know, which can probably also listen, you know, we don't need a human being in that hazardous situation, right? It increases the productivity, it, it manages the safety issue that was mentioned earlier. It has a different employee proposition at the same time. And this is a brick and mortar sort of an example. You take it into a service industry, you have similar opportunities, you know, and I will talk about what we are doing as a company applying this to our own workforce. So what does all of this mean, right, in, when you talk about the future of workforce, you know? It means that the way, you know, work is organized and the traditional structures of, of organization, I think that's going to go through a fundamental shift. You know, we had these functional organizations, departmental organizations, you know, people within those, you know, lines of management. I think that's going to significantly go through a disruption. And we are already seeing that, you know, in, within our company we are seeing that, but I think this is happening with our, you know, most of the leading industries. This is a trend that we will see. You know, people are going to be more organized around big initiative, big projects, you know, ability to bring together different skills at, at a rapid pace. They come together, create the big impact, and go back, you know. And then again they come in, and again they go back. In Accenture terminology, we call it hunting in tribes, you know. Uh, we, we, we come in, you know, a strategy guy, a consulting guy, a designer, an analytics guy come together, we create a success with one of our clients. And we, we then try to recreate that, you know, we do something in, in, in the U.S., we do something, the same kind of thing in Europe, we do something like that in India, and they don't come from the same organizations. And for our clients, it doesn't really matter because it is one Accenture, irrespective of which department of Accenture we are coming in. And if you look at a chart in organization, chart in Accenture, and we have our HR list sit here, it's very difficult to find an organization chart because, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It's actually losing its relevance because, you know, we are completely focused with our clients and which industries they, they focus on and how do we drive value there. The whole organizational structure and the, and the org chart is a very you know, non-relevant conversation in, in, in our context actually. Yeah? What work is performed? You know? Understanding whether this is value adding work or not. Right? If something is, I think I mentioned that in the panel, if something is automatable, let's make it happen. You know? Because this is an opportunity for human beings to do the work that they really like to do, right? All of us like to do creative work. All of us like to do actually, you know, much more challenging work, right? Do new things every month or every quarter, right? Every day. Let's do that rather than, you know, doing the same thing again and again, right? And that's how you, you retain people, you grow people, you give them their careers, right? Who performs that work, right? I mean, today, obviously, you know, we are already starting to see, you know, agents like the, my, my AI engine in the pocket. It's, it's, it's my companion, right? Without that, you know, I'm lost. The same thing is going to happen in the workforce, you know, where we will have our colleagues as chatbots and robots, right, who are actually going to be an integral part of the team composition. And what kind of governance mechanism and architecture you have to manage that kind of a team construct, which is a hybrid team, right, a software, a machine, and, and a human being. Why, when, and where people work? You know, those are the days gone, you know, when I started 20, 21 years back, you know, you had a manager who gives kind of, who has 20 years of experience and telling you what to be done. Today is very different, you know, we have got pretty smart people coming in right out of the campus, you know, who are very bold, who are very confident, who know the stuff, probably they know better than many of us actually, at least me, 
uh, and, and how do you give them the environment where they feel empowered and they feel they are in control of what work want, they want to do, when they want to do, how they want to schedule their calendar rather than being told. You know, I think we are pretty much with the millennials, we will, the, the being told culture will not work at all, right? Uh, they need to find a purpose, they need to find an intent and how do you create that for them, right? And how work is led and managed and that's the role I think people in this room, you know, we have to live it. Yeah, we have to, we have to create the whole atmosphere of experimentation, taking risk, failing fast, and learning new things. And it has to start with us, you know, then we can lead these, you know, smart people who are coming to work with us, right? If you look at it, you know, all of this, there is data around all of this, you know, how work is being organized today, what's the baseline, whether it's effective or not, you know, how will we do that in the future, what jobs are meaningful, what jobs are not meaningful, you know, how do we go to the next level of evolution, you know, and how do we take a data-driven approach around all of this. So I just wanted to share, you know, um, uh, some of these uh, big trends that we are seeing, and this is real. This is real, you know, and I, I just wanted to bring this as an example from, from you know, the developed uh, markets, right, with Germany. Um, you know, Germany is, a, is, is an engineering manufacturing base, right? But with the advent of, you know, Industrial 4.0, you know, with all IoT coming in, this is a big topic, you know. We are seeing, you know, some of the examples here, right, we are, we are, we are seeing, you know, trucks getting manufactured, right? And, and one of the value proposition is that how do we actually start creating a completely new experience for the driver, right? With all the insights coming in about the driving behavior, benchmarking with a fleet of 100 or 1,000 plus trucks, giving recommendation you know, directly to the driver saying that, hey, this is how you can improve your efficiency. This is how you will have a much easier drive between Basel to London, for example, right? The driver who is an employee for the fleet management company, this is great, yeah? This was something that was not available. And now with the power of data, you have a happy driver, I call it. Obviously, you can call it more productive, more efficient, but a happy driver, right? You look at uh, KUKA, you know, which is an industrial manufacturing company, and they are actually employing robots you know, who are working along with the, um, uh, you know, the shop floor guys, doing a particular part of the job and then handing it over back to the, back to the human. You know, who is then taking it on from there? The assembly operations are pretty much remotely managed and then it gets handed over. The final finishing, you know, a touch is given by the human employee, right? Um, we are talking about, you know, life sciences. Big focus, right, with all image recognition, machine recognition, how can you do a guided therapy? you know, for, for the doctor so that the doctor can have a much better efficacy in the treatment with the AI engine and the analytics engine behind it. So I just wanted to share, you know, some of this. This is really happening and it's all about improving the experience of, of employees, professionals, and creating, you know, much higher level of outcome and output from those employees, yeah? And what does all of this mean, right? Which means that the the, the traditional nature of job is actually going to change. And I already talked about some of that. The, the organizational, you know, traditional organizational structure and the boundaries, you know, they are actually vanishing. Uh, there are new roles that are coming up. And by the way, some of the roles that we see here are not fict fictional roles. You know, they are, they are real roles actually, you know. Uh, just to give an example, one of the paper and pulp company we are working in Indonesia, uh, they have like a million hectare of forests that they grow, right? And the uh, growth of the forests is very important for them to have improved profitability. And, and typically what they do, they send like four workers who are going around, you know, around the forest, sampling 20,000 trees, coming back after four days, then doing some data analysis to see how the trees are growing, right? You know, and it's a manual work. Right now, they are actually employing drones, which are flying over the entire population of trees, about a million hectares, right? Covering about 300,000 trees in five minutes, understanding the crown size, understanding the image of the the chlorophyll content on the leaves, you know, trying to understand where the trees are not growing. And then, you know, the analy analytics real time is happening on the edge based on which the, you know, spraying of pesticides is happening real time by the drones, right? And there is actually a drone operator who is managing that, yeah? And there is a control panel, you know, command center, you know, which is actually remotely kind of guiding, you know, as to how uh, and where the drone should go and what kind of intervention should be done. Just an example of how a new role has been created. This is a completely archaic, company, right? But the C, I mean, it's a family-run business, but the CEO has basically appointed his son, who is a 28-year-old kid, and he's running this program, right? And that has created a completely new digital revolution for that paper and pulp company. And now they are trying it in other parts of their business, right? So what does all of this mean, right? And I thought it's good to give our, our story because, you know, Accenture, as I mentioned in the panel, you know, we have gone through this big transformation of uh, you know, of going to digital, you know, 
uh, we, we, we realized it early on. We have five different businesses, very distinct businesses, very di distinct talent profile. And for us, talent is our key asset, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a very important business agenda, uh, not just an HR agenda, right? Without talent, we are just nothing, yeah? That's why organizations come to us. We work with all the Fortune 100 companies. They work with us because of our talent. And uh, it's very important for us to see how we are living this in, in, in real terms. There are a couple of trends I wanted to share with you that we are seeing you know, and how we are applying to ourselves. Uh, we come with uh, every year with our technology vision, which basically predicts you know, how life is going to be in the future and what is important. And there are a couple of themes on the people side that we are applying to ourselves. One of them is around design for humans. Uh, design for humans is all about insights about humans, you know, how we all think. Yeah? what kind of things we like, you know, what shapes our behavior, the way we behave, you know, and, and how do we understand that for 400,000 people at scale, right? Because that has a direct impact in terms of, you know, what kind of personalized experience we create for each of them. Uh, just to give, give some statistics, you know, we, um, we hired, I think, last year close to around 90,000 millennials globally, right? So that's the kind of intake, right, we have uh, of millennials. And, and what's the kind of experience we give to them, right? Because we need to personalize that experience for them because they demand that, they expect that from us. Um, as they come into the organization, uh, what kind of seamless, touchless experience they have to get onboarded, you know, within a day or two, where they have access to everything, you know, from the portal to the laptop to, you know, getting their email access, right, you know, and, and you know, MX corporate card and all of that, right? How do you create that experience so that it's seamless and you know, it's like a hotel check-in to some extent, right? How do you make that, make that so seamless, right? Uh, it's very important for us because you know, these people, they come with that expectation. Um, it's also very important to understand that you know, as we get these kind of insights, how do we start putting that into action and not think of AI or analytics as just a standalone piece, but how we create solutions that are directly embedded you know, with all of these capabilities. And I wanted to show, it, show you some of the things that we are doing here um, one of the big areas you know, is around talent acquisition. As I mentioned, with the volume of people we hire across so many different businesses with so many different skill sets from strategists to designers to data geeks to engineers to scientists, it's, 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 a, it's a mammoth undertaking, right? And how do we use machine learning um, at the core to understand what kind of people you know, will succeed in a setup like Accenture? How do we identify those characteristics you know, where we can clearly map that this is the DNA that we are looking for, you know, and, and if this person comes in, is going to be a high potential player for us. Because we, we have a DNA, you know, I mean, that has come in from our Anderson days, but we have a certain DNA, and we need to understand whether the person we are speaking to has that DNA or not. How do we select those, those people, you know? And then as they come into the organization, how do we create that kind of experience that they feel, wow, this is really cool, you know? And they are able to transmit that that interesting, cool factor back to our clients. That's so important. And that's why you know, we, we practice this uh, pretty much at scale for all of our businesses. What I will show you is um, a quick uh, walkthrough, you know, I think the storytelling that was mentioned, of how we do it for our technology delivery center. Uh, let me see if this works. So what you see here is a story of Mira, who is somebody who is interested to join Accenture. And Mira actually got, um, this is a summary, right? So Mira actually got a email saying that you know, she has been referred by a friend. She immediately gets contacted by Vikrant, you know, who does a, you know, selection through the algorithms that, that gives Mira's profile. Mira gets contacted, she uploads her profile, she gets into an interview call. Within a day, she gets the letter of intent, and within four days, she gets the offer. Sounds pretty cool, right? Uh, how does it happen? Mira, you know, she, on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, she gets an email message saying, hey, you know, your friend Mark has actually referred you. Uh, she, she, she clicks on the email, it actually opens up a video message from the you know, talent manager talking about the particular role. She reads through that, she listens to the video, she feels, wow, this is quite interesting. This is something that I would like to do. Um, and, and it marries with my uh, long-term interest and passion. Uh, she kind of you know, applies for that role on the mobile device and submits her, her, her profile. Vikrant on, the, on Monday morning you know, looks through his, his databases. He typically had a pretty uh, humongous amount of database to go through, but now with the algorithms and the predictive analytics, he is able to actually at speed understand which are the profiles that are right for the jobs. And he finds you know, the profile that Mira had submitted quite relevant. Calls up Mira you know, based on the analytics recommendation, 
has a great conversation, explains the role, understands a little bit of Mira's profile, and then based on that, sends out an email, automated email, saying that, hey, these are the documents that I would need from you. These are some of the next steps you know, that we will follow through. So, and Mira gets immediately that sort of uh, you know, trigger back from, back from Vikrant. She goes in and she actually decides when to schedule the interview. Right? And that's the difference. Yeah? She decides when the interview should happen. The interview gets fixed. He walks in. You know, Vikrant yeah, re receives her. She goes for the assessment test. And then that follows through a video interview. And then by end of that, Vikrant comes back and says, hey, your profile is very interesting for us. We would like to give you a letter of intent. Right? It happens within that few hours. And then based on that letter of intent, the background checks happen. And then within four days, you know, she's, um, you know, Mira has got the offer, and she accepts the offer. I think this is a little bit of a storytelling here, right? What I'm trying to talk about here is the analytics is embedded. This is not just an analytics story, but this is a digital solution that has been developed that creates a great experience for the employee, because that experience is very important for the employee to decide whether he or she wants to join Accenture or somewhere else, right? It's also very important for the talent manager to have a much shorter lead time to identify the people who are very relevant for that particular role, and then quickly convert that person, you know, who is like a lead, right, into an actual hire. And what you saw here was an end-to-end -end digital solution with analytics, with mobility, with the user interface, right, all of that in action, keeping both the talent manager in mind as well as the candidate in mind and creating a great experience for both of them. So the next one that I wanted to talk about is, you know, another big theme for us is, you know, about AI being the new UI. I touched upon that briefly, is that, you know, when it comes to people, it's about the interface, you know, and, and what kind of an intelligent interface we are able to create using analytics and artificial intelligence for, for the people is extremely important. And we believe that, you know, this is going to play a very pivotal role in the future, because this will start making, you know, AI in the fabric of, you know, human capital. What does that mean, actually, right? So this is something that um, you know, we have been working uh, pretty much for our technology application development group, uh, where we have actually created uh, what we call as the virtual agents. Um, and this is called MyWizard, which is a solution that we have deployed, which has virtual agents and bots who are working with our developers and project managers to help them identify during a project what kind of risks can be there you know, in, the, in that particular project. You know, if there are some applications that are being built, there are data scientists who are actually you know, doing analysis real time, and these are virtual data scientists, right? Who are actually doing analysis and understanding which part of the software patch might be at risk of an incident, right? And then give proactive remediation measures based on which the project team is able to understand that and is able to do those fixes as part of the project delivery. So what happens as a result of that, you have a complementary workforce helping you identify these things at scale, help you improve the delivery quality, and more importantly, you know, finish the project on time at the, at the right, uh, right price point. And this is something that you know, we have deployed in our technology delivery center. I'll quickly give you a quick, quick demo of this. Um, this is kind of how the, you know, uh, the MyWizard portal is. It has a command center kind of a setup. You go into the command center, it starts giving you a lot of uh, good insights about the performance of your project. You know, all the different metrics, you know, it starts giving you a good idea of what are the events that are happening, how each of the project streams are progressing, uh, you know, if there are any kind of alerts that you need to kind of look after. It's, it gives you all of those areas of you know, in, interest that is very important for a project manager. You know, it, it gives a very good feel to the project manager in terms of how the project is performing, what are the different project streams, and all of this is automated, by the way, right? And then there is a host of virtual agents. These are avatars that we have created. This is a data scientist avatar. There is a project manager avatar, you know, all of that. These data scientists are constantly, as I mentioned, analyzing the different risks that are there in the application development. You know, they are giving alerts you know, to the service manager saying, hey, you know, these are some of the problems that I foresee. Let me go down into the knowledge base you know, and then understand what the root causes are. And these are all automated root cause analysis that is happening on the knowledge base, machine learning at, at the back of it to constantly improve these you know, algorithms that are doing it. And then based on that, it come up, comes up with specific recommendations you know, and suggestions for improvements. What we also have is an automation arcade, right, with uh, you know, where we're using Blue Prism and you know, other kind of uh, platforms here to understand what kind of activities you know, that can be automated. And also applying machine learning to that to make sure that those activities, you know, as we understand the pattern, they're automatically getting, getting uh, into, into the rapid automation. 
And then we, call, we supplement all of that with our analytics to resolve the, all the different incidents. We look at multiple forms of data here. You know, we are looking at, the, obviously, the, the system data, the application data, but we are also looking at what kind of calls are coming to the call center, what kind of tickets are being raised, and can we do NLP on those tickets to understand what are the areas of focus you know, that we need to put so that the, the development team can go in and actually focus on those particular areas. And obviously, we are leveraging machine learning at the, at the heart of all of that. So I just wanted to kind of share with you, you know, some of this, just to give you a view that this is just a small example, you know, where we are, this is something that we are using with about 7,000 of our, um, you know, uh, software application developers. Uh, you know, we are serving about 200 plus client projects using that. Uh, but this is just a small example of how we are applying it to ourselves, uh, you know, uh, to make our people more effective, you know, make them shine with their clients and, and improve the, the cost of quality as well as the overall quality level for the, for the client. So I think we talked about two examples right now, just to recap, right? We, we first had an example where we talked about, you know, a little bit of how we are helping create the, you know, uh, solution, keeping the human in mind, improving the talent experience. The next piece is really around, you know, how we use analytics and AI to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our employees, right? And then the third piece is really around how do we create a new experience, you know, for, for our employees, especially the millennials who are coming in. And we have done something for our digital workforce called Challenge Me. Challenge Me is nothing but an AI engine you know, that constantly engages with you know, people who are coming into the organization to understand their profile, their demographics, you know, what their needs and wants are, and help them understand and, and make recommendations of what projects will be interesting for them, you know, for their profile, for their passion. What kind of people would be the right people for them to know within the Accenture network? Yeah? So that they can start getting connected to someone in Singapore, someone in Bay Area, somewhere, someone in Europe, so on and so forth, right? Gives recommendations around what kind of voluntary projects, you know, uh, NGO activities will be of interest for them. It gives them recommendation on how to drive work-life balance. And, you know, this is very powerful because, you know, what we have here, this is just a, um, a screenshot of the app. It basically starts helping employees to look at those options, you know, what you see on the green boxes, those are sort of the challenges, you know, that the employees can start configuring for themselves. And that goes back into the knowledge base. And then the AI engine that is learning, you know, based on the employee profile, starts coming up with recommendations, yeah, as, as I just mentioned, on all, all the dimensions. The employee can take those recommendations, accept the recommendations, work on the recommendations. After he or she feels that she has accomplished what she wanted to do, he or she wanted to do with the challenge, he or she gets a badge of honor saying that, you know, he or she took the challenge. And then the employee can actually, again, you know, tweet it back in our own internal social channel, saying, I have done that, right? Then he, can, he or she can annotate feedback, whether it was useful or not, because then that goes back into the engine, and it's, it makes the engine even much more efficient, right? What it also creates is the cultural change, you know? 10 people do it, 100 people see it. 100 people do it, 1,000 people see it, you know? And it drives, you know, irrespective of whether you're, you're in Mumbai or Bangalore or Frankfurt or it doesn't matter, you know? Uh, and and, and it, it, it creates, you know, as I said, you know, uh, declining the boundaries of the organization and geographies that you are in. You know, it doesn't really matter. You are one global resource and this is, this is what the organization offers you. What all of that means, right? I think from a journey perspective, you know, AI has a profound impact. Um, there are multiple entry points. Uh, you can start with, you know, more automation and efficiency gains. A lot of discussions are happening today in that space. Uh, we talked a lot today about analytics. And then how do you take, you know, all the machine learning, deep learning, to start creating these self-learning automated solutions? You know, and I, I demonstrated some of the solutions to you. How do you create that at scale for your business? It can start from talent acquisition, talent management, learning and development, retention, programs, you know, bring back programs, especially for women, women hires. How do you apply this at scale? I think that's the key. And the good news is you can start from anywhere, you know. You can start right from the automation route, move to the analytics, go to the self-learning solution, automated solution. You can right away go to the top, saying that, you know what, I need to do this self-learning automated solution just for women employees. I mean, this is a big program for us, bringing back women into the workforce is a big, big priority for us, right? How do we do that? We have a big alumni base. You know, we see people after they have made managers, you know, it is very hard in a consulting setup, right? How do you, you know, create that liquid workforce with those people who took a maternity leave, right, and probably then take a sabbatical to not lose them? We have to make a real effort for doing that, actually, right? And what role we can have the technology and the, and the methodologies and the algorithms play for us for that. So, in five years, where will all this be? Any guesses?
AI will become a first class citizen. It will be one of our team members, you know, pretty much uh, like the way we work with our human team members. Yeah? It's going to define the completely new architecture for us, which means a lot of open source coming in, you know, a lot of agile development coming in. We cannot be stuck into the legacy architecture. It will mean a complete revamp. An organization will be forced to do this, actually. What it also means is that we will change the face of the industry. We will change the face of ourselves as a company and change the face of the industry, IT industry as an example. I think there was a question that, that you asked earlier in that light, right? And obviously, it will unleash new levels of creativity and productivity. And this is the simple formula that I want to live with you, which is about you know, putting human at the center with the process and the data powered by AI. I think that's going to create the next level of you know, talent performance, talent experience, yeah? Uh, and the next level of human, human capital organizations. And the best way to do it is, let's create it, you know. Although we had all the estimates, it's all about, you know, creating it. And this is people in, in this room, people like all of us here, I think we can make it happen, you know. We can obviously choose to wait till it happens, right? But it is happening, you know. And it's people like us who have to make it, and that becomes our future, mm -hmm. right? So with that, I think I'm pretty much done. Thank you, and open for any questions. How to ensure that different HR functions and systems, example, talent acquisition, talent development, blah, 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 talk to each other in large organizations? OK, that's a, that's a very interesting question, actually. I have my HR lead sitting over here. You know, he, can, he can probably answer this better than me. It's an interesting perspective. You know? I mean, I just extrapolate this. This is, this is the typical situation where a lot of the companies are, right? But you know, people cannot afford to do this anymore, to be honest. Yeah? I think what is going to force this right, uh, is that these are all interrelated, if you see. The kind of talent acquisition you do should be based on the kind of skills that you actually need in the future. Your anticipation of what kind of skills that is required will actually inform what kind of talent you want to acquire and where you want to acquire from, right? And, and we are seeing that, you know, we are today seeing that. In our organization, we have this, you know, what we call as a talent supply chain. And we are trying to understand what kind of skills will we need in the future, in, in three years from now, five years from now right from the CEO to the analyst. We have a pretty good clarity. That defines, you know, Anirban, who is our HR lead, right? He takes that, and he is part of the business. You know, he is not sitting in his uh, just little HR cube, right? He is part of the business, and he knows exactly how that then defines his talent agenda, you know, and my talent agenda, saying that, you know, where do we then go for those skills? What kind of intervention programs we drive? And it is all interrelated. I mean, we spend about a billion dollar every year on learning and professional development around digital. And that is something all of us have to do it. Yeah? There's no escape to it, right? But then how do we start putting it in a way that it's systematic, it's inspirational, right? And it cannot be driven just by the L&D team on its own. It has to be sponsored by the business, working together with the HR business partner, along with the L&D partner, you know, together. And that's how, I think, is the, is the new organizational construct that we will see. We, will, we cannot afford to stay in those silos. If we stay in those silos, we will be the laggards, you know? And people who make those changes are the ones who will move forward. How are you using analytics for distinguishing high performers, if I got it right, and development interactions? I think this is, uh, you know, this is, I would say, quite classical for us. I mean, this is something we have been doing for quite some time. Yeah, Accenture, obviously, with our tagline, high performance organization. Uh, this is something we have been doing for quite some time. And we pretty much, you know, this is motivated from the customer life cycle. One of the things that we, we moved into uh, in the last 12 months, right, you know, with our CEO and chairman, he said, you know, we are a completely different organization. The traditional bell curve and the performance management doesn't work for Accenture, right? And I think all of you probably saw that. And we actually threw away our existing performance management, uh, you know, processes and structures and approaches, right? Because we believe that if we have to really attract and distinguish the high performance, uh, you know, performing players, that's not a way to do it. Because A, we are a high-performing organization. We, we hire the best, right? It's very important for us not to get into the bell curve phenomena because, you know, you then go into a force ranking, you know, process, and it's a waste of time, and we all realize that. It's a waste of time, at least in our context. We said, we hired the smartest people in the planet. Let's focus on what strengths they have, and let's focus on what is their ambition and passion, and let's fuel their strengths to help them achieve their, their ambition and passion. And that's what we call performance achievement. And there is a lot of data-driven approach that all of us go through. There is a lot of data about me. There is a lot of data about Anirban as an individual you know, within the organization. I get, I get a lot of insight about my people you know, in terms of what are their strengths you know, and then have discussion 
with that data, you know, and then marry that with the with the results we get in terms of where they want to go. You know, we also get a lot of insights from their activities. You know, that you know which communities they are part of. That gives us a good idea of what is the area that they are interested in, and how do we start marrying those areas of passion with the roles and the responsibilities that we are offering. So that's what we actually you know kind of do, uh, and that is a completely different paradigm for us. I think if you ask me, that is so fundamental. That is very fundamental. And you know, I will lend back to the theme of user interface, right? You know, when I say user interface, it's really the personal touch, actually. Yeah? Um, I think what will be important in the, in the future is that how are you able to use the available technology to create that? Because you know, the personal touch, at least the way I see the world in the future, we will not be together sitting like this, right? We will not be, you know, walking up to the other colleague, you know, on the other aisle, you know, because they might be in an airport, they might be, you know, in a in a in a, in a client premise, they might be traveling somewhere, right? So how do you start connecting with them, right, with the all the digital avenues that you have, right, and create the same experience as if you were kind of in person talking to each other, right? I think that will become very important because the workforce is going to be very distributed, very virtual, right? We will see a lot of freelancers. You know, coming up in the future, right? I mean, the expectation is that by 2020, 40 percent of the U.S. workforce will be all freelancers. Now, imagine if you are handling that kind of a workforce, right? How do you engage with them? So it's not just your own organization; it's your extended organization. You know, and how you engage with them using the digital capabilities, AI, analytics, all of that that we talked about to create that same experience that is seamless, that is differentiated, that is for me. You know, uh, I, I think that's the opportunity, and, and I think that's what we are already starting to live, honestly. Thank you, thank you so much, Arnab.